Hello, readers of Into the Wild by John Krakauer. Thanks for sticking with me. We got another one take recording, dramatic reading of this great book, and we pick up on chapter 10 Fairbanks. Dying in the wild, a hitchhiker recorded the terror. Anchorage, September 12th, Ape Associated Press. Last Sunday, a young hiker, stranded by an injury, was found dead at a remote camp in the Alaskan interior. No one is yet certain who he was. But his diary and two notes found at the camp tell a wrenching story of his desperate and progressively futile efforts to survive. The diary indicates that the man, believed to be an American in his late 20s or early 30s, might have been injured in a fall and that he has that he was then stranded at the camp for more than three months. It tells how he tried to save himself by hunting game and eating wild plants while nonetheless getting weaker. One of his two notes is a plea for help addressed to anyone who might come upon the camp while the hiker searched the surrounding area for food. The second note bids the world goodbye. An autopsy at the state coroner's office in Fairbanks this week found that the man had died of starvation, probably in late July. The authorities discovered among the man's possessions a name that they believe is his. But they have so far been unable to confirm his identity, and until they do, have declined to disclose the name. The New York Times, September 13, 1992. By the time the New York Times picked up the story about the hiker, the Alaska state troopers had been trying for a week to figure out who he was. When he died, uh, when he died, McCandless was wearing a blue sweatshirt printed with the logo of Santa Barbara Towing Company. When contract contacted, the wrecking outfit professed to know nothing about him or how he'd acquired the shirt. Many of the entries in the brief, perplexing diary recovered with the body were terse observations of flora and fauna, which fueled speculation that McCandless was a field biologist. But the but that ultimately led nowhere to. On September 10, three days before news of the dead hiker appeared in the Times, the story was published on the front page of the Anchorage Daily News. When Jim Galleon saw the headline and the accompanying map indicating that the body had been found 25 miles west of Healy on the Stampede Trail, he felt the hairs bristle across the base of his scalp. Alex. Galleon still held a picture in his mind of the odd, congenial youth striding down the trail in boots, two boots two sizes too big for him. Galleon's own boots the old brown extra tufts he persuaded the kid to take. From the newspaper article, what little information there was, it sounded like the same person, says Galleon. So I called the state troopers and said, hey, I think I gave that guy a ride. Okay, sure, replied trooper Roger Ellis, the cop on the other end of the line. What makes you think so? You're the sixth person in the last hour who's called to say they know the hiker's identity. But Galleon persisted, and the more he talked the more Ellis' skepticism receded. Galleon described several pieces of equipment not mentioned in the newspaper account that matched gear found with the body. And then Ellis noticed that the first cryptic entry in the hiker's journal read, Exit Fairbanks, Sitting Galleon, Rabbit Day. The troopers had by this time discovered the role of film in the hiker's Minolta, which included several apparent self-portraits. When they brought the pictures out to the job site where I was working, says Galleon, there were no two ways about it. The guy in the picture was Alex. Because McCandless had told Galleon he was from South Dakota, the troopers immediately shifted their search there for the hiker's next of kin. An all-points bulletin turned up missing person named McCandless uh, from eastern South Dakota, coincidentally from a small town only 20 miles from Wayne Westerberg's home in Carthage. And for a while, the troopers thought they'd found their man. But this, too, turned out to be a false lead. Westerberg had heard nothing from the friend he knew as Alex McCandless since receiving the postcard from Fairbanks the previous spring. On September 13th, he was rolling down an empty ribbon of blacktop outside Jamestown, North Dakota, leading his harvest crew home to Carthage after wrapping up the four-month cutting season in Montana, 
when the VHF radio barked to life. Wayne, an anxious, an anxious voice crackled over the radio from one of the crew's, truck, crew's other trucks. This is Bob. You got your radio on? Yeah, Bobby Wayne here. What's up? Quick, turn on your AM and listen to Paul Harvey. He's talking about some kid who starved to death up in Alaska. The police don't know who he is. Sounds a whole lot like Alex. Westerberg found the station in time to catch the tail end of the Paul Harvey broadcast, and he was forced to agree. The few sketchy details made the anonymous hiker sound distressingly like his friend. As soon as he got to Carthage, a dispirited Westerberg phoned the Alaska State Troopers to volunteer what he knew about McCandless. By that time, however, stories about the dead hiker, including excerpts from his diary, had been given prominent play in newspapers across the country. As a consequence, the troopers were swamped with calls from people claiming to know the hiker's identity, so they were even less receptive to Westerberg than they had been to Galleon. The cop told me that they'd made more than 150 calls from folks who thought Alex was their kid, their friend, their brother, says Westerberg. Well, by then I was kind of pissed at getting the runaround, so I told him, look, I'm not just another crank caller. I know who he is. He worked for me. I think I've got his social security number around here somewhere. Westerberg pawed through the files of the grain elevator until he found two W-4 forms McCandless had filled out. Across the top of the first one, dated from, dating from McCandless's initial visit to Carthage in 1990, he had scrawled exempt, 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 and his given name was Iris Fuck You. Address, none of your damn business. Social security number, I forget. But on the second form, dated March 30, 1992, two weeks before he left for Alaska, he'd signed his given name, Chris J. McCandless, and in the blank for social security number, he put down 228-316704. Westerberg phoned Alaska again. This time, the troopers took him seriously. Wow. It's almost like Chris maybe signed that, you're thinking, because he knew maybe like we've heard in previous chapters, he felt the weight and the danger of what he was doing, the finality, perhaps, of what he was doing. The social security number turned out to be genuine and placed McCandless's permanent residence in northern Virginia. Authorities in Alaska contacted law enforcement agencies in that state, who in turn started combing phone directories for McCandless's. Walton Billy McCandless had by then moved to, Mar moved to the Maryland shore and no longer had a Virginia phone number. But Walt's eldest child from his first marriage lived in Annandale and was in the book. Late on the afternoon of September 17th, Sam McCandless received a call from a Fairfax County homicide detective. Sam, nine years older than Chris, had seen a short article about the hiker in the Washington Post a few days earlier. But, he allows, it didn't occur to me that the hiker might be Chris. Never even crossed my mind. It's ironic because when I read the article, I thought, Oh my God, what a terrible tragedy. I feel really sorry for the family of this guy, whoever they are. What a sad story. Sam had been raised in California, in Colorado, in his mother's household, and hadn't moved to Virginia until 1987, after Chris had left the state to attend college in Atlanta. So Sam didn't know his half-brother well. But when the homicide detective started asking whether the hiker sounded like anyone he knew, Sam reports, I was pretty sure it was Chris. The fact that he'd gone to Alaska, he'd gone off by himself, it all added up. At the detective's request, Sam went to the Fairfax County Police Department, where an officer showed him a photograph of the hiker that had been faxed from, the, from, that had been faxed from Fairbanks. It was an 8x10 enlargement, Sam recalls, a headshot. His hair was long and he had a beard. Chris almost always had short hair and was clean-shaven. And, by the, and the face in the picture was extremely gaunt. But I knew right away. There was no doubt. It was Chris. I went home, picked up Michelle, my wife, and drove out to Maryland to tell Dad and Billy. I didn't know what I was going to say. How do you tell someone that their child is dead? That is the end of chapter 10, but I'll tell you... We are on a we are on a tear here. I know people want to get us towards the end, so why don't we move on to chapter eleven? That's right, double chapter episode happening here. Chapter eleven, Chesapeake 
Beach. It begins with a quote. Everything had changed suddenly. The tone, the moral climate. You didn't know what to think, who to listen to, as if all your life you had been led by the hand like a small child, and suddenly you were on your own. You had to learn to walk by yourself. There was no one around, neither family nor people whose judgment you respected. At such a time, you felt the need of committing yourself to something absolute, life or truth or beauty, of being ruled by it in place of the man-made rules that had been discarded. You needed to surrender to some such ultimate purpose more fully, more unreservedly than you had ever done in the old, familiar, peaceful days, in the old life that was now abolished and gone for good. That was Boris Pasternak, Dr. Zhivago, which is a book, and the passage highlighted in one of the books found with Chris McCandless's remains. Need for a Purpose had been written in McCandless's hand in the margin above the passage. Whew. Samuel Walter McCandless Jr., 56 years old, is a bearded, taciturn man with longish salt and pepper hair combed straight back from a high forehead. Tall and solidly proportioned, he wears wire-rimmed glasses that give him a professional demeanor. Seven weeks after the body of his son turned up, in Alaska, wrapped in a blue sleeping bag that Billy had sewn for Chris from a kit. Walt, wow. Did you catch that? So Chris died in a blue sleeping bag that Billy had sewn for Chris from a kit. Walt studies a sailboat scudding beneath the window of his waterfront townhouse. How is it, he wonders aloud as he gazes blankly across Chesapeake Bay, that a kid with so much compassion could cause his parents so much pain? The McCandless home in Chesapeake Beach, Maryland, is tastefully decorated, spotless, devoid of clutter. Floor-to-ceiling windows take in the hazy panorama of the bay. A big Chevy Suburban and a white Cadillac are parked out front. A painstakingly restored 69 Corvette sits in the garage. A 30-foot cruising catamaran is moored at the dock. Four large squares of poster board covered with scores of photos documenting the whole brief span of Chris's life had occupied the dining room table for many days now. Moving deliberately around the display, Billy points out Chris as a toddler astride a hobby horse, Chris as a wrapped eight-year-old in a yellow, train, yellow rain slicker on his first backpacking trip, Chris at his high school commencement. The hardest part says Walt, pausing over a shot of his son clowning around on a family vacation, his voice cracking almost imperceptibly, is simply not having him around anymore. I spent a lot of time with Chris, perhaps more than any of my other kids. I really liked his company, even though he frustrated us so often. Walt is wearing gray sweatpants, racquetball shoes, and a satin baseball jacket embroidered with the logo of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Despite the casual attire, he projects an air of authority. Within the ranks of his arcane field, an advanced technology called Synthetic Aperture Radar, or SAR, he is an eminence. SAR has been a component of high-profile space missions since 1978, when the first SAR-equipped satellite, CSAT, was placed into orbit around the Earth. NASA's project manager for that pioneering CSAT mission launch was Walt McCandless. The first line of Walt's resume reads, Clearance, current U.S. Department of Defense, top secret. A little farther down, the page and account of his professional experience begins, I perform private consulting services aligned with remote sensor and satellite system design and associated signal processing, data reduction, and information extraction tasks. Colleagues refer to him as brilliant. Waltz is accustomed to calling the shots. Taking control is something he does unconsciously, reflexively. Although he speaks softly in the unhurried cadence of the American West, his voice has an edge and the set of his jaw betrays an undercurrent of nervous energy. Even from across the room, it's apparent that some very high voltage is crackling through his wires. 
There's no mistaking when Chris's, whence Chris, wait, sorry. There is no mistaking whence Chris's intensity came. From his father, if that's not obvious, from my pronunciation of that sentence. Whew. When Walt talks, people listen. If something or someone displeases him, his eyes narrow and his speech becomes clipped. According to members of the, ex of the extended family, his moods can be dark and mercurial, although they say his famous temper has lost much of its volatility in recent years. After Chris gave everybody the slip in 1990, something changed in Walt. His son's disappearance scarred him and chastened him. A softer, or maybe scared, I think that's scared, one R, scared, and chastened him. A softer, more tolerant side of his personality came to the fore. Walt grew up poor in Greeley, Colorado, an agricultural town on the high, windswept plains up near the Wyoming line. His family, he declares matter-of-factly, was from the wrong side of the tracks. A bright child and driven, he won an academic scholarship to Colorado State University in nearby Fort Collins. To make ends meet, he held down an assortment of part-time jobs through college, including one in a mortuary but his steadiest paycheck came from playing with Charlie Novak, the leader of a popular jazz quartet. Novak's band, with Walt sitting in on piano, worked the regional lounge circuit, covering dance numbers and old standards and smoky honky-tonks up and down the front range. An inspired musician with considerable natural talent, Walt still plays professionally from time to time. I would love to play some killer like honky tonk piano sounds like chris our protagonist also was uh, big into piano really cool anybody here on the channel uh, piano players i'd be curious uh, to hear in 1957 the soviets launched sputnik one casting a shadow of fear across america in the ensuing national hysteria Con congress funneled hundreds of uh, funneled millions upon millions of dollars into the california-based aerospace industry and the boom was on for young Walt McCandless, just out of college, married, and with a baby on the way, Sputnik opened the door to opportunity. After receiving his undergraduate diploma, Walt took a job at Hughes Aircraft, which sent him to Tucson for three years, where he earned a master's degree in antenna theory at the University of Arizona. As soon as he completed his thesis, an analysis of conical helices, he transferred to Hughes's big California operation, where the real action was eager to make his mark in the race for space. He bought a little bungalow in Torrance, worked hard, moved quickly up the ladder. Sam was born in 1959, and four other children, Stacy, Shauna, Shelley, and Shannon, followed in quick succession. Walt was appointed test director and section head for the Surveyor 1 mission, the first spacecraft to make a soft landing on the moon. His star was bright and rising. By 1965, however, his marriage was in trouble. He and his wife, Marcia, separated. Walt started dating a secretary at, at Hughes named Wilhelmina Johnson. Everyone called her Billy, who was 22 years old and had dark, striking eyes. They fell in love and moved in together. Billy got pregnant. Very petite to begin with, in nine months she gained only eight pounds and never even wore maternity clothes. In February, on February 12th, 1968, Billy gave birth to a son. He was underweight, but healthy and animated. Walt brought, bought Billy a Gianni guitar on which she strummed lullabies to soothe the fussy newborn. 22 years later, rangers from the National Park Service would find that same guitar on the back seat of a yellow Datsun abandoned near the shore of Lake Mead. Ugh. Wow, well done, John Krakauer, connecting us from the very beginning, woof, right into the story. Because, you know, sometimes you take these segues, you hear a little bit about the backdrop, and you're sort of like, snore. But you see that, boom, how his parents were along with him, along for the trip. You know, he, the son, tries to cast them out of his mind. They're never not with him in their minds, you know, at so much of where he thinks he's operating independently from is within the fabric of his own family. And I think sometimes I remember when I grew up, you really took that for granted. You really overlooked that. 
until you become a parent yourself and try to sew that fabric and 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 weave in all those ingredients so painstakingly, so haphazardly, so chancily through time. Um, yeah. Marriage was in trouble. The guitar was there on the shore of Lake Mead. It's impossible to know what murky convergence of chromosomal matter, parent-child dynamics, and alignment of the cosmos was responsible, but Christopher Johnson McCandless came into the world with unusual gifts and a will not easily deflected from its trajectory. At the age of two, he got up in the middle of the night found his way outside without waking his parents, and entered a house down the street to plunder a neighbor's candy drawer. (laughs) In the third grade, after receiving a high score on a standardized achievement test, Chris was placed in an accelerated program for gifted students. He wasn't happy about it, Billy remembers, because it meant he had to do extra schoolwork. So he spent a week trying to get himself out of the program. This little boy attempted to convince the teacher, the principal, anybody who would listen, that the test results were an error and that he really didn't belong there. We learned about it at the first PTA meeting. His teacher pulled us aside and told us that Chris marches to a different drummer. She just shook her head. Even when we were little, says Corrine, who was born three years after Chris, he was very to himself. He wasn't antisocial. He's always had friends, and everybody liked him. But he could go off and entertain himself for hours. He didn't seem to need toys or friends. He could be alone without being lonely. When Chris was six, Walt was offered a position at NASA, prompting a move to the nation's capital. They bought a split-level house on Willett Drive in suburban Annandale. It It had green shutters, a bay window, a nice yard. Four years after arriving in Virginia... Walt quit working for NASA to start a consulting firm, User Systems Incorporated, which he and Billy ran out of their home. Money was tight. In addition to the financial strain of exchanging a steady paycheck for the vagaries of self-employment, Walt's separation from his first wife left him with two families to support. To make a go of it, says Kareen, mom and dad put in incredibly long hours. When Chris and I woke up in the morning to go to school, they'd be in the office working. When we came home in the afternoon, they'd be in the office working. When we went to bed at night, they'd be in the office working. They ran a real good business together and eventually started making bunches of money, but they worked all the time. It was a stressful existence. Both Walt and Billy are tightly wound, emotional, loath to give ground. Now and then, the tension erupted in verbal sparring. In moments of anger, one one or the other often threatened divorce. The rancor was more smoke than fire, says Corrine, but I think it was one of the reasons Chris and I were so close. We learned to count on each other when Mom and Dad weren't getting along. But there were good times, too. On the weekends and when school was out, the family took to the road. They drove to Virginia Beach or the Carolina Shore, to Colorado to visit Walt's kids from his first marriage, to the Great Lakes, to the Blue Ridge Mountains. We camped out the back of the truck, the Chevy Suburban, Walt explains. Later, we brought an Airstream trailer and traveled with that. Chris loved those trips. The longer, the better. There was always a little wanderlust in the family, and it was clear early on that Chris had inherited it. In the course of their travels, the family visited Iron Mountain, Michigan, a small mining town in the forest of the Upper Peninsula that was, where, uh, that was Billy's childhood home. She was one of six kids. Lauren Johnson, Billy's father, obstinately worked as a truck driver. But he never held any job for long, she says. Billy's dad didn't quite fit into society, Walt explains. In many ways, he and Chris were a lot alike. Lauren Johnson was proud and stubborn and dreamy, a woodsman, a self-taught musician, a writer of poetry. Around Iron Mountain, his rapport with the creatures of the forest was legendary. He was always raising wildlife, says Billy. He'd find some animal in a trap, take it home, amputate the injured limb, heal it, and then let it go again. Once my dad hit a mother deer with his truck, making an orphan of its fawn. He was crushed, but he brought the baby deer home and raised it inside the house, behind the wood stove, just like it was one of his kids. To support his family, Lauren tries tried a series of entrepreneurial ventures, none of them very successful, 
He raised chickens for a while, then mink and chinchillas. He opened a stable and sold horse rides to tourists. Much of the food he put on the table came from hunting, despite the fact that he was uncomfortable killing animals. My dad cried every time he shot a deer, Billy says. But we had to eat it, so he did it. He also worked as a hunting guide, which pained him even more. Men from the city would drive up in their big Cadillacs, and my dad would take them out to his hunting camp for a week to get a trophy. He would guarantee them a buck before they left, and most of them were such lousy shots and drank so much that they couldn't hit anything, so I'd usually have to shoot the deer for them. God, he hated that. Lauren, not surprisingly, was charmed by Chris, and Chris adored his grandfather. The old man's backwoods savvy, his affinity for the wilderness— left a deep impression on the boy. When Chris was eight, Walt took him on his first overnight backpacking trip, a three-day hike in the Shenandoah to climb Old Rag. They made the summit, and Chris carried his own pack the whole way. Hiking up the mountain became a father-son tradition. They climbed Old Rag almost every year thereafter. That's awesome. I would love to do something like that with, uh, with my kid. When Chris was a little older, Walt took Billy and his children from both marriages to, not my one kid, my any of my kids, right? You don't care. Uh, <laughs> when Chris was a little older, Walt took Billy and his children from both marriages to climb Long's Peak in Colorado at 14,256 feet, the highest summit in Rocky Mountain National Park. Walt, Chris, and Walt's youngest son from his first marriage reached the 13,000-foot elevation. There, at a prominent notch called the Keyhole, Walt decided to turn around. He was tired and feeling the altitude. The route above looked, schlab- looked slabby, exposed, dangerous. I'd had it, okay, Walt explains, but Chris wanted to keep going to the top. I told him no way. He was only 12 then, so all he could do was complain. If he'd been 14 or 15, he would have simply gone on without me. Walt grows quiet, staring absently into the distance. Chris was fearless, even when he was little, he says after a long pause. He didn't think the odds applied to him. We were always trying to pull him back from the edge. Chris was a high achiever in almost any everything that caught his fancy. Academically, he brought home A's with little effort. Only once did he receive a grade lower than B, an F, in high school physics. When he saw the report card, Walt made an appointment with the physics teacher to see what the problem was. He was a retired Air Force colonel, Walt remembers. An old guy, traditional, pretty rigid. He explained at the beginning of the semester that because he had something like 200 students, lab reports had to be written in a particular format to make the grading of them a manageable proposition. Chris thought it was a stupid rule and decided to ignore it. He did his lab reports, but not in the correct format, so the teacher gave him an F. After talking with the guy, I came home and told Chris he got the grade he deserved. Both Chris and Kareen shared Walt's Walt's musical aptitude. Chris took up the guitar, piano, French horn. It was strange to to see in a kid his age, says Walt, but he loved Tony Bennett. He'd sing numbers like Tender is the Night while I accompanied him on the piano. He was good. Indeed, in a goofy video Chris made in collabor- in college, he had been heard belting out Summers by the Sea slash Sailboats in Capri with impressive panache, crooning like a professional lounge singer. A gifted French horn player, as a teen, he was a member of the American University Symphony, but quit, according to Walt, after objecting to rules imposed by a high school band leader. Kareen recalls that there was more to it than that. He quit playing partly because he didn't like being told what to do, but also because of me. I wanted to be like Chris, so I started to play French horn too, and it turned out to be the one thing I was better at than he was. When I was a freshman and he was a senior, I made first chair in the senior band, and there was no way he was going to sit behind his damn sister." Their musical rivalry seems not to have damaged the relationship between Chris and Corrine, however. They'd been best friends from an early age, spending hours together building forts out of cushions and blankets in their Annandale living room. He was always really nice to me, Corrine says, and extremely protective. 
He'd hold my hand when we walked down the street. When he was in junior high and I was still in grade school, he got out earlier than me, but he'd hang out at his friend Brian P- uh, Pakowski's house so we could walk home together. Chris inherited Billy's angelic features, but most notably her eyes, and the black depths of which betrayed his every emotion. Although he was small, in school photographs he was always in the front row, the shortest kid in the class. Chris was strong for his size and well-coordinated. He tried his hand at many sports, but had little patience for um, learning the finer points of any of them. When he went skiing during family vacations in Colorado, he seldom bothered to turn. He simply crouched in a gorilla tuck, feet spread wide for stability, and point the board straight down the hill. Likewise, says Walt, when I tried to teach him to play golf, he refused to accept that, uh, that he refused to accept that form is everything. Chris would take the biggest swing you would ever saw every time. Sometimes he'd hit the ball 300 yards, but more often he'd slice it into the next fairway. Chris had so much natural talent, Walt continues. But if you tried to coach him, to polish his skill, to bring out that final 10%, a wall went up. He resisted instruction of any kind. I'm a serious racquetball player, and I taught Chris to play when he was 11. By the time he was 15 or 16, he was beating me regularly. He was very, very quick and had a lot of power. But when I suggested he work on the gaps in his game, he refused to listen. Once in a tournament, he came up against a 45-year-old man with a lot of experience. Chris won a bunch of points right out of the gate, but the guy was methodically testing him, probing for his weaknesses. As soon as he figured out which shot gave Chris the most trouble, that was the only shot Chris saw, and it was all over. Nuance, strategy, and anything beyond the rudimentaries of technique were wasted on Chris. The only way he cared to tackle a challenge was head-on, right now, applying the full brunt of his extraordinary energy. And he was often frustrated at a con- as a consequence. It wasn't until he took up running, an activity that requires will and determination more than finesse or cunning, that he found his athletic calling. At the age of 10, he entered his first running competition, a 10-kilometer road race. He finished 69th, beating more than 1,000 adults, and was hooked. By the time he was in his teens, he was one of the top distance runners in the region. Well, I never was that, but I can also relate to finding that athletic calling in, in running and cross countries when I did in, in high school. And I felt just the same way. This doesn't require finesse or cunning. It doesn't even require learning plays that you'd have to do in team sports that I had done. This is your sheer will and determination and a little bit of strategy of timing out, like when you're going to step on the gas and stuff like that. When Chris was 12, Walt and Billy brought Kareen a puppy a Shetland sheepdog named Buckley, and Chris fell into the habit of taking the pet with him on his daily training runs. Buckley was supposedly my dog, says Corrine, but he and Chris became inseparable. Buck was fast, and he'd always beat Chris home when they went running. I remember Chris was so excited the first time he made it home before Buckley. He went tearing all over the house yelling, I beat Buck, I beat Buck. At W.T. Watson High School, a large public institution in Fairfax, Virginia, with a reputation for high academic standards and winning athletic teams, Chris was the captain of the cross-country squad. He relished the role and concocted novel, grueling training regimens that his teammates still remember well. He was really into pushing himself, explains Gordy Chukalu, a younger member of the team. Chris invented this workout he called Road Warriors, He'd lead us on long, killer runs through places like farmers' fields and construction sites, places we weren't supposed to be, and intentionally try to get us lost. We'd run as far and fast as we could down strange roads, through the woods, whatever. The whole idea was to lose our bearings, to to push ourselves into unknown territory. Then we'd run at a slightly slower pace until we found a road we recognized and race home again at full speed. In a certain sense... That's how Chris lived his entire life. McCandless viewed running as an intensely spiritual exercise, verging on religion. Chris would use the spiritual aspect to try to motivate us, recalls Eric Hathaway, another friend on the team. He'd tell us to think about all the evil in the world, all the hatred, and imagine ourselves running against the forces of darkness and the evil wall that was trying to keep us from running our best. He believed doing well was all mental, 
a simple matter of harnessing whatever energy was available. As impressionable high school kids, we were blown away by that kind of talk. Seriously, right? What a charismatic leader. But running wasn't exclusively an affair of the spirit. It was a competitive undertaking as well. When McCandless ran, he ran to win. Um, Chris was really serious about running, says Chris Maxey Gilmer, a female teammate who was perhaps McCandless's closest friend at Woodson. I can remember standing at the finish line watching him run, knowing how badly he wanted to do how badly he wanted to do well and how disappointed he'd be if he did worse than he expected. After a bad race or even a bad time trial during practice, he could be really hard on himself. He wouldn't want to talk about it. If I tried to console him, he'd act annoyed and brush me off. He'd internalize the disappointment. He'd go off alone somewhere and beat himself up. It wasn't just running, uh, Chris took so seriously, Gilmer adds. He was like that about everything. You weren't supposed to think about heavy-duty stuff in high school, but I did. And he did too, which is why we hit it off. We'd hang out during snack break at his locker and talk about life and the state of the world, serious things. I'm black and I could never figure out why everyone made such a big deal about race. Chris would talk about me, would talk to me about that kind of thing. He understood. He was always questioning stuff in the same way. I liked him a lot. He was a really good guy. McCandless took life's inequities to heart. During his senior year at Woodson, he became obsessed with racial oppression in South Africa. He spoke seriously to his friends about smuggling weapons into that country and joining the struggle to end apartheid. Um, we'd get into arguments about it once in a while, recalls Hathaway. Chris didn't like going through channels, working within the system, waiting his turn. He'd say, come on, Eric, we could raise enough money to go to South Africa on our own right now. It's just a matter of deciding to do it. I'd counter by saying we were only a couple of kids and that we couldn't possibly make a difference. But you couldn't argue with him. He'd come back with something like, oh, I guess you just don't care about right and wrong. On weekends, when his high school pals were attending keggers trying to, and trying to sneak into Georgetown bars, McCandless would wander the seedier quarters of Washington, chatting with prostitutes and homeless people, buying them meals, earnestly suggesting ways they might improve their lives. Chris didn't understand how people could possibly be allowed to go hungry, especially in this country, says Billy. He would rave about that kind of thing for hours. On one occasion, Chris picked up a homeless man from the streets of D.C. and brought him home to leafy, affluent Annandale and secretly set the guy up in the Airstream trailer his parents parked beside the garage. Walt and Billy never knew they were hosting a vagrant. On another occasion, Chris drove over to Hathaway's house and announced they were going downtown. Cool, Hathaway remembers thinking. It was Friday night, and I assume we were headed to Georgetown to party. Instead, Chris parked down on 14th Street, which at the time was a real bad part of town. Then he said, you know, Eric, you can read about this stuff, but you can't understand it until you live it. Tonight, that's what we're going to do. We spent the next few hours hanging out in creepy places talking with pimps and hookers and lowlife. I was, like, scared. Toward the end of the evening, Chris asked me how much money I had. I said $5. He had 10 Okay, you buy the gas, he told me. I'm going to get some food. So he spent the 10 bucks on a big bag of hamburgers, and we drove around handing them out to smelly guys sleeping on grates. It was the weirdest Friday night of my life. But Chris did that kind of thing a lot. Early in his senior year at Woodson, Chris informed his parents that he had no intention of going to college. When Walt and Billy suggested that he needed a college degree to attain a fulfilling career, Chris answered that careers were demeaning 20th century inventions, more of a liability than an asset, and that he could do fine without one, thank you. That put us into kind of a tizzy, Walt admits. Both Billy and I came from blue-collar families. A college degree is something we don't take lightly, okay? And we worked hard to be able to afford to send our kids to good schools. So Billy sat him down and said, Chris, if you really want to make a difference in the world, if you really want to help people who are less fortunate, get yourself some leverage first. Go to college. Get a law degree. And then you'll be able to have a real impact. 
Chris brought home good grades, says Hathaway. He didn't get into trouble. He was a high achiever. He did what he was supposed to do. His parents didn't really have grounds to complain, but they got on his case about going to college. And whatever they said to him, it must have worked because he ended up going to Emory, even though he thought it was pointless, a waste of time and money. It's somewhat surprising that Chris ceded to pressure from Walt and Billy about attending college when he refused to listen to them about so many other things. There was never a shortage of apparent contradictions in the relationship between Chris and his parents. When Chris visited with Chris Gilmer, he frequently railed against Walt and Billy, portraying them as unreasonable tyrants. Yet, to his male buddies, Hathaway, Chukalu, and another track star, Andy Horowitz, he simply complained, he scarcely complained at all. My impression was that his parents were very nice people, says Hathaway. No different, really, than my parents or anyone's parents. Chris just didn't like being told what to do. I think he would have been unhappy with any parents. He had trouble with the whole idea of parents. McCandless's personality was puzzling in its complexity. He was intensely private, but could be convivial and gregarious in the extreme. Despite his overdeveloped social conscience, he was no tight-lipped, perpetually grim do-gooder who frowned on fun. To the contrary, he enjoyed tipping a glass now and then and was an incorrigible ham. Perhaps the greatest paradox concerning his feeling were concerned his feelings about money. Walt and Billy had both known poverty when they were young and after struggling to rise above it saw nothing wrong with enjoying the fruits of their labor. We worked we worked very very hard, Billy emphasizes. We did it even when our kids were little, saved what we earned and invested it for the future. When the future finally arrived, they didn't flaunt their modest wealth, but they bought nice clothes, some jewelry for Billy, a Cadillac. Eventually, they purchased the townhouse on the bay and the sailboat. They took the kids to Europe, skiing in Breckenridge, on a Caribbean cruise. And Chris, Billy acknowledges, was embarrassed by all that. Her son, the teenage Tolstoyan, believed that wealth was shameful, corrupting, inherently evil which is ironic because Chris was a natural-born capitalist with an uncanny knack for making a buck. Chris was always an entrepreneur, Billy says with a laugh. <laughs> always. As an eight-year-old, he grew vegetables behind the house in Annandale and then sold them door-to-door -door around the neighborhood. He was this cute little boy pulling a wagon full of fresh-grown beans and tomatoes and peppers, says Corrine. Who could resist? And Chris knew it. He'd have this look on his face like, I'm damn cute. Want to buy some beans? By the time he came home, the wagon would be empty and, we'd have a, and he'd have a bunch of money in his hand. When Chris was 12, he printed up a stack of flyers and started a neighborhood copy business, Chris's Fast Copies, offering free pickup and delivery. Using the copier in Walt and Billy's office, he paid his parents a few cents a copy, charged the customers two cents less than the corner store charged, and made a tidy profit. In 1985, following his junior year in Woodson, Chris was hired by a local building contractor to canvas neighborhoods for sales, drumming up siding jobs and kitchen remodelings. As he, and he was astonishingly successful, a salesman without peer. In a matter of a few months, half a dozen other students were working under him, and he'd put $7,000 into his bank account. And this is in 1990s money or 80s money. He used part of the money to buy the yellow Datsun, the second-hand B210. Chris had such an outstanding knack for selling that in the spring of 1986, as Chris's high school graduation approached, the owner of the construction company phoned Walt and offered to pay for Chris's college education if Walt would persuade his son to remain in Annandale and keep working while he went to school instead of quitting the job and going off to Emory. When I mentioned the offer to Chris, says Walt, he wouldn't even consider it. He told his boss that he had other plans. As soon as high school was over, Chris declared he was going to get behind the wheel of his new car and spend the summer driving across the country. Nobody anticipated that the journey would be the first in a series of extended transcontinental adventures. Nor could anyone in his family have foreseen that a chance discovery during this initial journey would ultimately turn him inward and away, drawing Chris and those who loved him into a morass of anger, misunderstanding, and sorrow.
Well, there we have it. Quite a session, almost 45 minutes here. Uh, double chapters. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for all the support that you show me and especially the author, the great John Krakauer, who wrote all this. I hope you're doing well. If you're doing this for a school assignment, drop me a comment. Let me know what you think and how you're doing. See you on the next one. <laughs>